Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My first time here in 2024. There's nobody here 108 years old, so nobody's going to remember what happened in 1920, so I can make it all up if I wanted to. <laughs> but I'm not. Uh, 1920 was a very pivotal year in the United States because you couldn't have liquor and women got the right to vote nationally uh, that year, among other things. Now, this guy is the President Woodrow Wilson, but he suffered a major stroke in October of 1919, thoroughly incapacitated. His wife ran the country. Edith Wilson ran the country and they covered it up. It was a major cover-up. This is America, 1920, and that is Times Square in 1920. Uh, looks pretty much the same, doesn't it? As it did. Prohibition started in 1920. Uh, you couldn't drink. Uh, you could, but you weren't supposedly, supposedly legally allowed to drink. And many women could vote in the November election. Now, I'm going to explain who could vote, who couldn't vote, and how there were a lot of states that already allowed women to vote. New York State started in 1917, but there were strings attached. Warren G. Harding becomes the President of the United States. The worst bombing on U.S. soil took place in 1920, up to 1920, down in Wall Street, 23 Wall Street. Uh, the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. The Klan was heavily involved in what was going on in the country at that point. The beginning of this guy, Adolf Hitler, starts in 1920. And some of you might have had mothers, aunts, cousins, sisters, I'm not sure about sisters, who were flappers. Anybody here who had a mother, cousin, uh, you had a flapper? Uh, mother. Your mother was a flapper. <laughs> yes. She was a liberated woman. Right. She wore the flapper dress and had the haircut and all that. Right. And danced to Charleston. Right. So if you didn't she, dance to Charleston. She taught me the Charleston. She taught you the Charleston. In the kitchen. In the kitchen. <laughs> so she didn't forget it. So uh, the flapper actually makes its first appearance in 1920. Any New York Yankees fans here? Because Babe Ruth becomes a member of the New York Yankees in 1920. Uh, and the fix is in. Accidentally, a grand jury found out that the 1919 World Series was fixed by eight members of the Chicago White Sox. And uh, Negro Baseball League starts in 1920. Of course, the Negroes were barred from Major League Baseball since 1884. And if you wanted to listen to the radio in 1920, this is what you li literally had to do. You had to have headphones, you had to have a, a set, and there wasn't really that much on except KDKA in Pittsburgh became the first uh, radio station, commercial radio station in the U.S. How many of you ever read the book Main Street by Sinclair Lewis? Do you like it? I don't remember. You don't remember? College. Well, Main Street was about what was going on in the Midwest by Sinclair Lewis, part of the lost generation. Uh, Gertrude Stein coined that term, lost generation, and she was talking about writers like Sinclair Lewis and uh, uh, Ernest Hemingway would eventually talk about it more and uh, also uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald and Zelda Fitzgerald in those people. <coughs> the president is dangerously ill. That finally came out in February of 1920. But it had been a long time coming because Woodrow Wilson got sick in September of 1919 and it was covered up something which you would not be able to do today with uh, media, with radio, television, internet, phones. But uh, anyway, the president is dangerously ill. In a perfect world, Woodrow Wilson would have sought re-election in 1920, and he would have broken the American presidential tradition of not seeking a third term established by George Washington. The perfect ending for Woodrow Wilson 
would have been at the end of World War I, get the League of Nations going, and uh, also end war. But he couldn't do it. The Senate was not interested. The court of public opinion was not interested in his ideas, the 14 points, and also the League of Nations. This guy, Henry Cabot Lodge, was a senator from Massachusetts, and he is the main impediment to Woodrow Wilson getting what Wilson perceived as peace on earth. Uh, he was the nemesis in establishing the League of Nations. Wilson wanted the League of Nations. He felt that if countries could get together and talk about their differences, it would make war, well, you wouldn't need a war after what they went through between 1914 and 1918 with terrible, terrible conditions, millions of men died. But uh, Henry Cabot Lodge said, uh, well, you know what? It was a good thing we were in World War I on the side of the Allies, but, but we weren't really prepared in 1917. And he attacked Woodrow Wilson in 1917 as a weak leader and a hopeless idealist. Um, in a speech before Congress, and this is 1918, on January 18th, Wilson laid out something called 14 points. This was an ambitious blueprint for the end of World War I. It emphasized national self-determination for small countries, for large nations, and also let us, let us create a cooperative League of Nations, and that would peacefully resolve all future res uh, disputes. Lodge said the 14 point plan, nah, no, no. In Germany, Germany started this war. We have to militarily and economically crush them so they will never, ever, ever, ever again try to start a war in Europe. They were a threat against the stability of Europe. And here is uh, 1919. Paris gives Wilson welcome of unexampled <coughs> war. Uh, he declares for exemplary punishment of war makers. He too is ready to crush Germany. Sees enduring peace only in a League of Nations. Most of 1919, Woodrow Wilson was not around in the United States. He was in Paris, Versailles, uh, Versailles Peace Treaty. That's what he wanted. Uh, and he was going there, the Americans came into the war in 1917 and they helped the Allies. The Allies in this case, England, France, and Italy. Uh, for most, for about six months, uh, between December 1918, the war ends on November 8, 1918, in June 1919, Wilson is hammering away, negotiating a treaty, uh, and helping to build the League of Nations, that's what he wanted. Treaty signed on June 28, 1919. Uh, back home, now nah, people aren't happy about the treaty. It's got mixed support. Uh, a lot of opposition from Republican senators. Of course, Wilson was a Democrat, led by Lodge and the Irish Catholic Democrats of Wilson's party. And this is the League of, uh, rather the Treaty of Versailles, the Allies and Associated uh, Powers and Germany Treaty uh, between France and Great Britain, and that was the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, Lodge opposed approving the Treaty of Versailles because the treaty basically said, the U.S., if anything goes wrong, we're going to send troops back in, and we don't need, the President could decide, we don't need congressional approval. And Lodge said, no, 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 no. You need congressional approval. In the League of Nations, uh-uh. Nope, we don't want any part of it. Congress has to be the final determination as to when you go to war, when you send troops in harm's way. On September 3rd, 1919, Woodrow Wilson decides to go out to the public, and he is going to sell his idea, the League of Nations. And he's going from East Coast to West Coast, and he's on the presidential train, and he is going to go out there for about three and a half weeks, and he's riding the rails, going from city to city, saying, hey, listen, this is a good deal. Listen to me. Uh, he was accompanied by his physician, a guy by the name of Dr. Kerry T. Grayson, who said, you know what, maybe you shouldn't do this. 
Maybe you shouldn't. May not be good for you. Well, Wilson was never the picture of health while he was in the White House. And this grueling trip starts to get to him, declining health. He wanted to promote American membership in the League of Nations, the international body he hoped would solve international conflicts and prevent another bloody world war like the one that had just ended a few months earlier. But the tour, three and a half weeks on the rails, took a big toll on Wilson's health. During September, as the presidential train traveled across the Midwest into the Great Plains, uh, states over the Rockies into the Pacific Northwest then down the West Coast before turning east the president became thinner paler and even more frail lost his appetite the asthma he had grew worse he complained of unrelenting headaches and he gets to Utah and this is the first real sign of trouble for Woodrow Wilson um, it's the evening, September 25th, 1919. Goes from Utah to Pueblo, California. And his wife, Edith, discovered Woodrow Wilson in a profound state of illness. His facial muscles were twitching uncontrollably, and he was experiencing severe nausea. Earlier in the day, he complained of a splitting headache. On September 26th, the president's private secretary, a guy by the name of Joseph Tumulty announced that the rest of the speaking tour had been canceled because the president was suffering from a nervous reaction in his digestive organs. <laughs> no big deal. He's going to recover. He needs a few days rest. Well, it was 8,000 miles in 22 days. Ever do 8,000 miles in 22 days on the train? That's grueling. Uh, he suffered from the headaches. Uh, during the tour, finally, he collapsed from exhaustion in Pueblo, Colorado. He managed to return to Washington only to suffer a near fatal stroke. And there is Wilson, and there is the woman who, after October 1919, was the de facto president of the United States, Edith Wilson. She was the gatekeeper. She went through all the papers. She met everybody. And if you wanted to get to Woodrow Wilson, you had to get through her. And it has been suggested, never proven, it's hard to prove, that she actually was signing whatever Woodrow Wilson, she had Woodrow Wilson sign. It's October 2nd, 1919. According to some accounts, the president awoke to find that his left hand was numb to sensation before falling into unconsciousness. Other versions, uh, Wilson had a stroke on the way to the bathroom, fell to the floor with Edith dragging him back into bed. Uh, however, the events transpired immediately after the president's collapse. Mrs. Wilson discreetly uh, phoned down to the White House chief usher, a guy by the name of Ike Hoover, and said, please get Dr. Grayson. The president is very sick. Grayson arrived. Uh, a few minutes later, he emerged from the presidential bedroom, and the doctor's analysis and diagnosis was terrible. My God, the president is paralyzed. There is Wilson, and there is Dr. Grayson. Country does not know a thing. Does not know one thing. The president of the United States is incapacitated. Wilson at that point was uh, in his late 50s. Late 50s, yeah. Uh, so the president's incapacitated. Uh, the public is never told of Wilson's stroke. Cover-up begins. Dr. Grayson and Edith Wilson. Uh, they thought that it would be best if Wilson was not informed about how seriously ill he really was. Uh, when Dr. Grayson briefed the cabinet uh, and uh, the question of secession came up, he refused to sign any notice of disability. He also discouraged letting the public know the extent of the president's condition. In other words, the United States is rudderless. The guy who was elected president can't function. Now, this guy, Robert Lansing, right here, is in Wilson's cabinet, and he almost spills the beans. The details of the condition was kept, public, uh, kept from the public until February, when it was revealed that the Secretary of State, Robert Lansing, had been calling the cabinet meetings 
and had suggested that perhaps it was time to have Vice President Thomas Marshall assume the role of president. That didn't please Edith. She's running the country. She is literally running the country. And she calls Lansing in, demands he resigns. And he does. He resigns on February 13th. Edith Wilson is running the country. By early March, there were four bills up on Capitol Hill that addressed the question of um, executive absence or disability. Uh, the proposals uh, would have placed the decision of presidential re removal temporarily or permanently into the hands of the Supreme Court or the cabinet. Well, nothing happened. Nothing happened. And Wilson stayed on, or should I say, Edith Wilson stayed on as president. Uh, Edith Wilson blamed uh, Republican opponents in Congress for her husband's stroke, uh, as their vehement opposition to the League of Nations often took form of character assassination. She was suspicious of the political motives of the Vice President, Thomas Marshall. So she was the gatekeeper. You want to see Woodrow Wilson? You have to go through her and she would decide whether or not you could see the President of the United States, and more often than not, you never saw her. Uh, she kept the true extent of Wilson's incapacitation from the press and the opponents, while Wilson laid in bed unable to speak or move, either purportedly insisted she screen all of Wilson's paperwork, in some cases assigning Wilson's name to all documents without consulting him. Uh, Edith denied that she uh, usurped her husband's position during his recovery in her memoirs and said, nah, 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 I'm only acting as a steward. What do you think? Think she's running the country? Yes. A woman was running the United States in the year 1920. Wilson was incapacitated. Who's running the country? Edith Wilson. Senate would say no to uh, the uh, League of Nations in November of 1919, uh, and uh, they also said no to the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, it was not the first time that the Senate said no to the League of Nations. Uh, there would be another time in 1920 on March 20th. And there is the League of Nations. It does form. On January 16th, uh, it, hit, it uh, holds its first executive council meeting, uh, and there were members who were there. On uh, November 15th, they would officially open the General Assembly in Geneva, Switzerland. 41 countries were part of the gathering. The United States was not there. So this is America in 1920, and uh, this is a... Um, it, from Kentucky, and notice it's all women. It's all women. They get the right to vote in 1920. Uh, the 1920 America, well, the country was recovering from the devastation and death of the Spanish flu. I had two great uncles who died from the Spanish flu. According to my family, they were poisoned by lovers. They <laughs> wanted to make it sound better, but they, were, they, they died from the Spanish flu. Country was inflamed with racial violence and anxious about immigration. America was torn between isolationism and globalism, which opened the door for a presidential candidate who promised there would be a return to normalcy. And that guy's name was William, uh, rather Warren G. Harding. But uh, that normalcy would include two significant changes. Prohibition and not all but most women getting the right to vote. Prohibition, that's Carrie Nation. She doesn't have her ax there, but prohibition had been a long time in coming in the United States. January 16, 1919, the 18th Amendment was ratified. Uh, placing alcohol prohibition in the United States Constitution, the country would go dry on January 17. In 1826, the first of temperance societies, American temperance, society form. While it had some success, it wasn't until the proliferation of saloons after the Civil War that the temperance movement gained more traction. Prohibition. Uh, and here are the women uh, back in 1874 trying to close down this bar. 1873, the Women's Christian Temperance Union 
was founded and the temperance movement got its most forceful voice. The uh, history of the temperance movement and the women's movement were together linked, which explains why the uh, Women Christians Temperance Union originally uh, proposed the ban of alcohol as a method of preventing abuse from their alcoholic husbands. Women were getting beaten up after the guys were, uh, their husbands were in the bar all night, they came back, they started battering the women. And that is one of the reasons why the WCTU was involved. And they spent many years building the movement through education, local and state laws. In 1881, they had big success as uh, Kansas uh, included a ban on alcohol in their state constitution. And there is Carrie Nation. She's got an axe. She has an axe to grind. She has an axe. And uh, if you look, there's the bartender. He's frightened behind there. And all kind of broken bottles of alcohol right on her, at her feet. Uh, Carrie Nation came to prominence by attacking saloons with a hatchet. How would you like to see a woman coming in with a hatchet? Uh, all saloons still maintain their popularity through uh, uh, and, and uh, also the uh, temperance movement was on decline between, the, well, right before uh, the Progressive Era started in 1890. Um, but between 1890 and 1920, uh, there was hostilities towards saloons. A push for prohibition gained momentum with women and uh, Protestant congregations leading the way. <laughs> During World War I, there was a temporary prohibition on alcohol production. There was also a pronouncement, a pronounced anti-German sentiment pushed by the Anti-Saloon League since most people who were brewing beer were Germans. Uh, and often the loudest uh, opponents of prohibition uh, were the Anti-Saloon League people. Uh, this temporary situation dealt a serious blow, though, uh, to uh, the, uh, uh, rather, uh, the anti-saloon people were the loudest opponents against uh, prohibition. And this would deal a, a blow to the anti-prohibition forces. But support for the ban on alcohol continued. Close the saloon. If you believe that traffic in alcohol does more harm than good, help stop it. Strengthen America's campaign. And this is out of New York, uh, that uh, ad. On uh, December 18, 1917, a constitutional amendment to prohibit alcohol was proposed in the Senate, and in October 1919, Congress passed the Volstad Act, a uh, National Prohibition Act, which was the enabling legislation that set down the rules for enforcing the ban on alcohol and defined the types of alcohol beverages to be prohibited. The 18th Amendment was ratified and the country went dry. There was a woman who told me a couple weeks ago during Prohibition, she said, we had all the alcohol we wanted. I said, where? She said, in the Bronx. I said, where? In our bathtub. <laughs> we were making alcohol in our bathtub. People were doing that. It's a the, bathtub gin. A bathtub gin, gin. yeah. Uh, the Prohibition movement had finally achieved its goal to get rid of society, American society, of the, tyr of the tyranny of drinking. That's what they thought. But you know what? The act of drinking wasn't illegal. It was just, it was illegal to make wine at home. You know, uh, you, you, know you, you could do some of that, of that. Farmers grew fruit, retained the ability to produce hard cider. Whiskey and wine were available for medicinal and religious purposes. All you needed to know was a doctor would get a prescription. You could get all the booze you wanted. All you had to do was go to your priest, your rabbi, clergyman. Hey, it's religious. Hey, it's a religious ceremony. Good. Boom. And that was that. Prohibition. Vote dry. These are men who said vote dry. The entire American society was in an upheaval. People reacted differently to the one-size-fits-all approach of banning alcohol. Almost overnight, saloons and breweries and distilleries across the country had to close, and Americans had to find alternative ways to get booze, go to speakeasies, illicit bars that sold alcohol away from the prying eyes of the law, spread it up quickly for those who wanted to sneak a drink, and a new line of work opened up 
for two big criminals and gangsters called bootlegging. And there was money to be made. And in 1974, I was working at the Rockland Drive-In Movie in Muncie, New York. And our projectionist was a guy by the name of Albert Morris, uh, who was about 74, 75 years old at the time. And he was a World War I vet. He flew planes in World War I. And he came home to Rockland County and needed a job. Couldn't find a job, really. And then Prohibition came about. He was a Canadian citizen, married to an American. And the, if you lived in Spring Valley, I don't know how many of you know the, the geography of Spring Valley, but Spring Valley wasn't very far from Suffern. I don't know how long it took in those days with those roads, but you can get to Suffern, and that was where the train came down from Montreal. And that's where Albert Morris, Al Morris, went. He picked up the booze in Suffern. He brought it back to his house in Spring Valley threw it in the bathtub, watered it down, put it in bottles, put it back on the train, suffering. The train goes west to Chicago. That's where the booze ended up. So I'm talking to Al one day, I'm going into journalism and all, and so I decided to literally interview him. I said, uh, how much you get paid for it? After he told me the story, how much you get paid for it? I don't know. I said, who paid you? I don't know. Where'd the booze come from? I don't know. Where'd the booze go? I don't know. Al, this is 1974, Prohibition's over 41 years. You could spell the beans. I know nothing. He wouldn't tell me. Wouldn't tell me. But he made money. He made money. Alcohol didn't go away entirely with the pro uh, Prohibition. Uh, the wealthy, including many politicians, brought out the inventories of the realtors and wholesalers. And of course, there were the bootleggers who like Al, who kept the uh, supply flowing. One of the politicians who voted for prohibition was in the Senate. He was a guy by the name of Warren Harding, Ohio Senator, the 1920 presidential candidate, and a guy who was known to enjoy a drink after prohibition went into effect, or maybe two drinks, or maybe three drinks. Women's suffrage, official program, women's suffrage, procession, Washington, D.C., March 3rd, 1913. The women are going to Washington asking for the vote. On the eve of the inauguration of President Woodrow Wilson in 1913, protesters uh, thronged a massive suffrage parade in the nation's capital. Hundreds of women were injured. Why were they injured? Well, they were protesters, and the cops went after them. Same year, Alice Paul founded the Congressional Union for, Un uh, for Women's Suffrage, uh, which later became the National Women's Party. Alice Paul, interesting character, went on a hunger strike, protesting that she could not vote. Well, they arrested her, but they didn't arrest her and put her in jail. They put her in an insane asylum and fed her because she refused to eat. Uh, the organization staged numerous demonstrations, regularly picketed the White House among uh, their militant tactics. As a result of these actions, some group members were arrested and served jail time. Uh, there is a new leader after Alice Paul. Her name is uh, Carrie Chapman Catt. In 1918, Wilson switched his stance on women's voting rights from uh, objection to support through the influence of this woman, Carrie Chapman Catt. She was leading the movement and easier to deal with than Alice Paul. And Wilson also tied the proposed suffrage amendment to the United, in America to America's involvement in World War I because women had an increased role in the war efforts. They took the job, yes? Why did the woman who was active... Alice Paul? Alice Paul. Yeah. Why did she... Hunger strike? She wanted the vote, oh. and she was willing to die to get the vote. She was willing to die. Really? That was Paul is a rather interesting woman. I, if, if you have the time, I suggest there were books on her. There's a museum in New Jersey, the Alice Paul Museum, and just look up. She, really? she lasted until 1972 uh, pushing the Equal Rights Amendment. In fact, she wrote uh, the initial Equal Rights Amendment, I think, in 1923. Read wow. about her. Very interesting woman. Uh, when the amendment of suffrage came up for a vote, Wilson addressed the Senate, said, I'm in favor. 
As reported in the New York Times on October 1st, 1918, Wilson said, I regard the extension of suffrage to women as vitally essential to the successful prosecution of the great war of humanity in which we are engaged. And one thing I can tell you about this, women were voting in places like Wyoming, Idaho, Utah, Colorado, New York State, 1917, certain women got the right to vote in New York State in 1917. In just statewide elections? Uh, in statewide, yes. Kentucky says yes. There was a bunch of women. Kentucky says yes. By 1920, every state west of the Mississippi allowed women to vote. Uh, only nine states denied the women to vote in all instances, and seven of those were among the original 13 colonies. The last yes vote needed for the ratification of the 19th Amendment, uh, which provided for women's suffrage, was Tennessee. On August 18th, the Tennessee House of Representatives voted in favor of the amendment, 50 to 49. And how many of you have sons? How many of you have sons? Are they good boys? Do they listen to you? Do, do your sons listen to you in their 20s? Do they listen to you? They do now. But they, they do now. Imagine. Well, there is a story about this guy. His name is Harry Byrd. Harry Byrd. And he listened to his mom. Harry Burr, the Tennessee State Senate voted to ratify, but in the House of Representatives, the vote resulted in a tie. Harry Burr was 24 years old, and he cast the tie-breaking vote. He was unsure about his vote, but he had a letter from his mother, Feb Burr, in his pocket. And she's advising him what to do. The letter was delivered to him in the chamber. Hurrah, and vote for suffrage, and don't keep them in doubt. I've been watching to see how you stood the mother guilt trip. Is that the mother guilt trip? Is that the ultimate mother guilt trip? I've been watching to see how, the, how you vote stood. I haven't seen anything. Don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat. <laughs> he listened to his mother, and he voted yes. And with that, there was women's suffrage around the country, and women could vote in national elections. And there is Woodrow Wilson and Edith Wilson. Is that, a true story? that is a true story. Wilson wanted to run. Would your son have done that for you? Don't know. You don't know. How many of you have sons? Would they have done that for you? You say your son would have done that for you. So, and you said you don't know. I probably, probably would. Probably, yes. I, I don't know if I would have listened to my mother, but that's another story. Wilson wanted to run for a third term in 1920, but he couldn't campaign. So he's out. The strongest candidate would have been his son-in-law, a guy by the name of William McAdoo, who was the Treasury Secretary, and he had married one of Wilson's daughters, uh, Eleanor, but he couldn't get going. Uh, so he couldn't get the nomination. So it came down to two guys who were Ohio newspaper editors and owners, Warren G. Harding and James Cox. The 1920 election was a referendum on Woodrow Wilson, as Warren G. Harding called for a return to normalcy and blamed all the country's troubles on the man in the White House. James Cox ran on domestic issues, such as unemployment and inflation, not Wilson's internationalism. He's running away from um, Wilson as well, party member. And here's this, look at this guy, Warren G. Harding. Looks like he's having a good time. You know, in high school, his nickname was Adonis. Adonis. Interesting character. He, uh, he looks like an engine. Entertainer. Well, <laughs> he's not very attractive. Uh, well, I don't know about I that. Idea. I wouldn't say that. Uh, he and his good personal friend Jerry got into a lot of trouble. They were never separated. Uh, what did return to normalcy mean? Sound like a good slogan. Might have been Harding's conception of normalcy that included business deregulation, civic engagement, and isolationism. But he looked like a president. He looked like a president. And that's all the Republicans wanted. 
He was a small town Marion, Ohio newspaper publisher who somehow got involved in politics and began winning elections. He was in the Senate uh, when he became a compromised candidate for the Republican nomination in 1920. Didn't have much of a record in the Senate, but ladies thought of him as viral and handsome and photographed well. He looked like a president, said Harry Doherty, one of his Ohio cronies and backers. And not only did he look like a president, he was surrounded by people like this guy, Al Jolson, who even wrote a song for Harding for 1920. And he had a French por front porch campaign uh, in Marion, Ohio, and he would invite celebrities like Jolson to come and give him a public endorsement. And there was alcohol always available, even though it was prohibition. Jolson sang his campaign song, Harding, You're the Man for Us, which Jolson composed and wrote. I don't know if he did that. You know the story about Jolson. If you wanted your song to go somewhere, you had to attach Jolson's name and give him part of the royalties uh, publishing. But there were other celebrities who went to Marion to campaign for him. You ever hear of Douglas Fairbanks? Yes. Ever hear of Lillian Gish? Yes. Pearl White? Yes. Mary Pickford? How about Lillian Russell? Yes. Yeah, they were there. Not only them, them, but the Chicago Cubs baseball team went to Marion, Ohio to play an exhibition game against the local Marion semi-pro team, and Warren G. Harding put on the Chicago Cubs uniform. <laughs> he was a celebrity, a celebrity long before John Kennedy. He was the first celebrity presidential candidate. And here is uh, James Cox, and this is his running mate, Franklin Roosevelt, before the polio. There they are. They're out campaigning. James Cox chose uh, Roosevelt as his running mate, but he was hampered by his association with Wilson, and he was unpopular. Who was unpopular for getting the United States into World War I? The main issues of the election, the war's aftermath, and whether to join the League of Nations. Uh, prohibition and women's voting, first time, were part of the campaign. Harding supported Prohibition. Cox opposed it. Cox ran a vigorous campaign. Well, Harding just kind of hang out and drank in Marion, Ohio. But Harding got 60% of the vote. He won in a landslide. Now, I'm sure all of you remember the worst terrorist attack in U.S. history, World Trade Center, September 11th. 2001. Through 1920, this was the worst terrorist attack on U.S. soil, and it was on 23 Wall Street. Uh, September 16th, a horse-drawn cart carrying a massive improvised explosive was detonated in front of 23 Wall Street. One eyewitness described two sheets of flame that seemed to envelop the whole width of Wall Street as high as the 10th floor of tall buildings. 38 people were killed in the Wall Street bombing, and hundreds were injured. It was the worst terrorist attack in American history. Excuse me? I'm amazed that they were never identified. Oh, they, the perpetrator, yeah, they thought they were Italian anarchists, but they didn't know who they Amazing were. They thought they were Italian uh, were innocent. Yeah, yeah, they were Italian, they thought it was Italian anarchists, but they could never prove it. And Woodrow Wilson helped the rise of the KKK, because Wilson was a racist. He was a racist, and uh, I'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, the revival of the Klan was inspired by Birth of a Nation. Uh, the director, D.W. Griffiths, uh, violently anti-black blockbuster film in 1915 that promoted the uh, lost cause, uh, the view of the Civil War of Southerners. The movie was shown at the White House. Woodrow Wilson enthusiastically watched the film and gave it his seal of approval. On June 7th, Ku Klux Klan um, leader named William Simmons hired a publicist to grow membership for the white supremacist organization that year. Uh, the 100% Americanism campaign promoted the Klan as the defenders of white nation from uh, defilement by black people, by Catholics, <laughs> by Jewish people, foreigners, moral offenders. Uh, the neat package of hatred caught the 
attention quickly as the KKK was getting new members from around the country. Over there, over there. There you go, you're singing the song. Over there. The Yanks are coming. Yeah, the Yanks are coming, and they came. And the war would be over by November 11th, 1918. First war and its subsequent peace settlements uh, gave rise to new ambitions, uh, rivalries, tensions. People had high expectations that the post-war peace settlement would create a new world order and ensure that the slaughter of the First World War was never repeated. Here is Wilson, and here's the Treaty of Versailles. Was the First World War really had so many fatalities? Yes, it had a lot. Here's Wilson and Clemenceau and David Lloyd George and Orlando from Italy. Uh, David Lloyd George, oh well, he was from Great Britain. Viterio Orlando from Italy. George Clemenceau from France and Woodrow Wilson. Uh, the Big Four carved up Europe. They wanted to make sure Germany was severely punished and that a German surrender was not enough in 1918. And German soldiers like the wounded Adolf Hitler were infuriated with the settlement. Why did Hitler hate Jews? Why did he hate Jews? During World War I, between 1914 and 1918, Adolf Hitler was a soldier in the German army. At the end of the war, he and many other German soldiers, uh, like Hermann Goering, among others, couldn't get over the defeat of the German Empire. The German army command spread the myth, the big lie, the big lie. Army didn't lose. They were betrayed on the battlefield. Who betrayed them? Stab in the back. It was called at that time. Hitler bought into the myth. Jews and communists had betrayed the country and brought a left-wing government to power that wanted to throw in the towel. 1919, Hitler penned a letter to a colleague that would be known as the Gremlich letter. It was about how horrible the Jews were. And Hitler starts speaking in 1920. February 4th, 1920, Hitler delivered the Nazi Party platform speech, a large crowd in Munich, Germany. An event that is often regarded as the foundation of Nazism. The German Workers' Party had already existed. Hitler was a great orator, lays out 25 points in his platform. Central idea, strengthen German citizenship uh, by excluding and controlling Jewish people and others deemed to be not German. Here's the catch. Hitler was born in 1899 in Austria. He was not German. He was Austrian. And according to the Hitler doctrine, he would have been thrown out of Germany. There's your mother. Is that your mother? Is that your mother? Flapper? No. no? She didn't look like that? No. How about when she was young? I don't know. You don't know? This is Olive Thomas. And this is a picture called The Flapper. Um, times were changing rapidly. First appearance of the flapper style in the United States came from the popular 1920 Francis Marion film, The Flapper, starring Oliver Thomas. Thomas starred in a similar role in 1970, but the flapper term was not used at that time. There were more flappers. Uh, they're going into a speakeasy called The Crazy Cat. Who originated the name Flappers? I don't know. Just the name. Have Supposedly, it. it was women dancing in England like that at some Spirit point. Flapping. My mother danced on a table. Your mother danced on the table? Where? Somewhere downtown. Somewhere downtown. You want to tell me any more? Do you want to share it with anybody? <laughs> I don't know. And you went to Catholic school, right? Yeah. And she was a flapper. Right. She wanted to make sure you wouldn't be a flapper. <laughs> right. <laughs> she danced on tabletops. Right. It's speakeasies. Yeah. I don't know. Where else would she be dancing on tabletops? She had to be spe it's speakeasies. Anyway, <laughs> in the United States, the popular contempt for prohibition was a factor in the rise of the flapper. With legal saloons and cabarets close, she might have been a cabaret, uh, back alley speakeasies became uh, prolific and popular. 
the discrepancy between law-abiding religious-based temperance movement and the consumption of alcohol led to widespread disdain for authority. So your mother had widespread disdain for authority, right? Right. She must have. And then she or sent she, you to... She then, was a good Catholic. She was a good Catholic, doing, dancing on tabletop? <laughs> Unlike their mothers, except in your case, Unlike their mothers and grandmothers, flappers tended to go to high school and college. Flappers went to work. Flappers liked earning money and wanted independence. And they, she's on the tabletop. Is that your mother? No. <laughs> well, she could have been dancing on the tabletop, though. She uh, could have been. Yeah. Flappers set the stage for a much more liberated view of women's sexuality in that they made it so women would no longer be considered impure uh, or immoral or dangerous uh, for engaging in casual consensual, uh, consensual sexual activities. Uh, the flappers were a grave concern and worry to their parents. Did your mother worry your grandmother? I, I assume so. I assume so. Uh, educators, physicians, and clergymen who feared that sports in higher education would be ruinous. The flappers went to, women playing sports that is. The flappers went to speakeasies, which is a place where they drank alcohol. And who provided the alcohol? Al Morris. <laughs> Al Morris, in some cases, provided by gangsters. And all you had to do was know the secret password, or the secret word. Hey, even Harpo Marx, who never spoke to get in, he knew what the secret password was, swordfish. Uh, when Prohibition took effect on January 17, 1920, many of the formerly legal saloons across the country uh, catering to men only closed down. People wanted to drink, but they had to buy their liquor from licensed druggists for medicinal purposes, clergymen for religious reasons, or the illegal sellers known as bootleggers. The uh, other option, go enter that private uh, unlicensed bar room named Speakeasy, because you have to speak like this to get in, to gain entry, as to not be overheard by law enforcement officials who probably were inside as well drinking. <laughs> Speakeasies, that's the uh, prohibition's worst kept secret. Uh, prohibition was difficult to enforce. The demand for alcohol was outweighing the demand for sobriety. And people found clever ways to uh, evade prohibition uh, agents, uh, hip flasks. Hollow canes, you know those sticks that you walk down Fifth Avenue? Hollow them out, put the liquor in, and go into St. Patrick's Cathedral. It's a religious ceremony. <laughs> False books and the like. Uh, the federal and the local authorities uh, just couldn't keep up with what was going on. They didn't have the resources necessary to enforce prohibition. In general, uh, in small rural towns, yeah, they kept prohibitions. Uh, prohibition laws, but places like New York ain't happened. There were uh, as many as 25, 30,000 speakeasies in New York. Speakeasy could be somebody's bathtub, uh, or it could be a swanky looking place like that. Uh, there were also <laughs> unintended uh, consequences of prohibition. Some cash strap restaurants shuttered their doors uh, since they could no longer make a profit from liquor sales. Thousands of people, because they lost their liquor license, uh, thousands of people died each year from drinking cheap uh, moonshine, tainted with toxins, and revenue shrank for many uh, states that had previously relied on liquor taxes to fund roads, schools, and other public benefits. From uh, Los Angeles to Chicago to New York, organized crime syndicates supplied speakeasies and underground establishments with large quantities of beer and liquor. These complex bootlegging operations use rivers and waterways to smuggle alcohol across state lines. The mobsters were always three steps ahead, or three miles ahead if you were on a boat in international waters, say between Canada and, May and the US, uh, ahead of law enforcement. Babe Ruth, Boston Red Sox. That's a young Babe Ruth. He's about 24 years old at that time. His contract is sold to the New York Yankees. On January 5th, even though the transaction was uh, 
agreed to a week earlier around uh, Christmas, Babe Ruth's contract was sold to the New York Yankees by the Boston Red Sox owner Harry Frisay for a reported $125,000, about $17.4 million today. But the actual number has been, never been confirmed, but this is the promissory note that was used to send Babe Ruth to New York, and this goes back to Boston from Jacob Rupert, the Yankees owner. 1929, Babe Ruth hit 29 home runs for Boston, drove in 113 runs, scored uh, 103 runs. He was a drawing card, and he wanted a new contract uh, that would pay him about $20,000 a year, or $372,000 today. Today, Babe would get a $45 million a year contract. Uh, but he signed the contract uh, in 1919 for three years, a silly move on his part. Uh, and he was contractually obligated to play for Boston for $10,000 a year, $174,000 annually. And that is Harry Frisay. You probably know him more as the producer of No No Nanette, the play. Uh, by the fall of 1919, Harry Frisay's fortunes had changed. Uh, he was asset rich, cash poor. Babe Ruth helped deliver the uh, 1918 World Series to Boston, but the Great War disrupted the public appetite for amusements. 1918-1919 had been shortened, diminishing gate receipts, taking money out of Harry's pocket. Uh, he also had a screen production called Good Bad Woman, and it closed in a month. He lost money on that. And also, for say, didn't like Babe Ruth's lifestyle often filled with drinking and huge meals, and he thought that uh, Ruth was more spectacular than useful. And here he is, a member of the New York Yankees. Babe Ruth hit 54 home runs for his new team. He would become a New York star at a time when celebrity was becoming big business. Ruth's Yankees finished three games behind the American League pennant winner Cleveland. For say, his Red Sox moved up in the standings from sixth place in 1919 to fifth in 1920. But not all is well in baseball. Eight White Sox players are indicted on charge of fixing the 1919 World Series. Uh, Eddie Chicago got $10,000, Shoeless Joe Jackson $5,000. There were suspicions that the 1919 World Series between the Cincinnati Reds and Chicago White Sox was rigged. The new season started. Previous World Series faded into oblivion. But there was, a, there was word around Chicago that there was a Chicago Cubs-Philadelphia Phillies game that was rigged earlier in the 1920 season. And there was an investigation, and they found something else, the grand jury, on August 31st. Um, they found out that there might have been the rigging and fixing of the World Series. Uh, and all of a sudden, this gambler by the name of M Bill Mayard went public with his own account of his, in of his involvement in the fix. September 24th, the grand jury turns to the 1919 World Series when the New York Giants pitcher, Rube Benton, testifies that he knew the series was fixed and names Chick Gandell, Oscar Flesch, Lefty Williams, and Eddie Chicotti as the fixers. And it was eight, and this headline in the paper, Fix These Faces in Your Memory, Eight Men Charged with Selling Out Baseball. Oh. Ch Chicotti uh, testified before a grand jury. I don't know why I did it. I needed the money. I had the wife and kids. Shortly afterwards, the star hitter, Shoeless Joe Jackson, testified and admitted to have accepted $5,000, $90,000 today from his teammates. Over the next few days, Lefty Williams and Oscar Felch also confessed their involvement. Chicago White Sox owner Charles Comiskey suspended the seven 1919 players who were still on the team a few days before the end of the season. Suspensions and indictments. On October 22nd, the grand jury handed down its indictments, naming the eight Chicago players, along with five gamblers, including Bill Burns, Sports Sullivan, Abe Attell. The indictments included nine counts of conspiracy to defraud various individuals and institutions. Rube Foster, uh, he came up with the Negro National League. Did they go to jail? I'm going to tell you that when we get to the end. 
Uh, the former pitcher and Chicago American Giants owner, Andrew Rube Foster, persuaded other owners of, uh, of uh, seven other black teams to form the Negro National League, uh, specifically to expand opportunities for players to control their finances. Uh, the league's first game uh, pitted the Indianapolis ABCs against the Chicago White, uh, Giants on May 2nd. I am sure they're going to have a Super Bowl party here. Super Bowl is a week from Sunday, February 11th, so I'm sure you're going to be in the Super Bowl party here. Well, this is the beginnings of football, professional football in the United States. 1902, the Chicago Football League. Um, there were pro football, uh, the, the pro football beginnings were in the mid 1890s. Some players were paid. 1902, baseball's Philadelphia Athletics and Philadelphia Phillies formed professional football teams, joining the Pittsburgh Stars in an attempt to, uh, at a pro football league, name the National Football League. The Chicago Football League was formed in several local clubs, such as the Chicago Tigers, as well as some outside teams like the Hammond, Indiana team, and uh, Rockford, and Deco uh, Decatur, and uh, Racine, Illinois, and Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Same time, there was uh, the Ohio League and the New York State League. By 1904, the Ohio League had at least seven pro teams with Massillon winning the professional title, the Ohio Independent Championship. And then in the mid-19-teens, Jim Thorpe, Canton Bulldogs. 1915, Jack Cusack signed. Jim Thorpe named him the uh, Canton Bulldogs captain, and the team was called the Canton Bulldogs. 1916, with Thorpe and his former Kyle High School uh, teammate, uh, Pete Carlack, starring Canton, went 9-0-1, won the Ohio League Championship. The Canton team was proclaimed pro football's champion. Curly Lambeau, the Green Bay Packers, 1919. Uh, he and George Calhoun organized the Green Bay Packers, uh, whose namesake, Lambeau's employer, uh, the Indian Packing Company. They provided $500 for equipment and allowed the team to use the company field for practice. The NFL is coming. That is the Akron Pros. They're in this league. And by the way, if you look closely at this picture, there is a Negro player on the team. Long before Major League Baseball. His name is Fritz Pollard. Um, too many leagues causing problems. Football owners wanted to stop dramatically <laughs> rising salaries from, say, $75 a game to $90 a game. Players continually jumping from one team to another, <laughs> following the highest order, and the use of college players still enrolled in school. The Akron Pros, Canton Bulldogs, Cleveland Indians, Dayton Triangles, meeting in Canton, Ohio. That's the formation of the American Professional Football Conference. Second meeting followed with teams from Ohio, Indiana, New York, and Illinois in attendance. And the league's name is now the American Professional Football Association. Uh, that is the Rockford Island Independence, a membership fee, $100 per team charged. Nobody ever paid that fee, but they thought it was respectable. September 26, uh, non-league member St. Paul uh, played Rockford Island before 800 people. Rockford Island won 48-0. The APF survives. That is Fritz Pollard. Uh, at the beginning of December, most of the teams in the AF, uh, APFA had abandoned their hopes for a championship. Some of them, including the Chicago Tigers, Detroit Heralds, finished their seasons, disbanded, franchise canceled by the league. Uh, the APFA allowed Negroes to be part of the league, which was something Major League Baseball did not allow. Fritz Pollard was a member of the Akron Pros, the team that won the championships. When you say that, I think a In baseball, 1946-47. Uh, that is David Sarnoff. How many of you heard of RCA? NBC. David Sarnoff was the guy who conceived of the radio. Uh, after the Titanic hit an iceberg near Halifax, Nova Scotia on April 14, 1912, radio operators picked up SOS signals from the sinking ship. One of those uh, radio operators was David Sordoff working at the Wanamaker's Manhattan I Store. Am. How many of you remember Wanamaker's? Oh, I remember. You remember Wanamaker's.
is. He wants shouting here. No longer exists. Uh, and we're uh, a small telegraph uh, station operator. 1915, 1916, Sarnoff wrote uh, the Radio Music Box Memo, where he proposed the development of a commercially marked radio receiver for the use in the home, based on this experience, picking up the signals from the Titanic. 1919, the Radio Corporation of America gets the Marconi Station from the U.S. Navy. That station is called 8MK in Detroit, and it's owned by the Detroit News. It's not commercial radio. It doesn't have a commercial license, but its first broadcast was August 31st, 1920, and uh, they delivered the news. It was billed as an amateur radio station. November 2nd, uh, 1920, George Westinghouse Labs, KDKA, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, became the first commercially licensed radio station. Its first program, the Harding Cox presidential election results. <laughs> the announcer, Leo Rosenberg, delivered the results starting at 6 o'clock. Who licensed this? The government. Okay, Flappers Philosophers by F. Scott Fitzgerald. And Zelda's here. Zelda Fitzgerald is thought to be the first flapper. She probably wasn't. The Lost Generation. Uh, they were expatriate writers who lived in Europe following World War I. They became a force in American literature. Among the books published in 1920, Main Street, The Skewering of Small Town America by Sinclair Lewis, This Side of Paradise, the debut novel of F. Scott Fitzgerald, Flappers and Philosophers, uh, Fitzgerald's first collection of short fiction. Fitzgerald also introduced Maxwell Perkins, uh, the four, uh, of uh, Scribner's uh, for, uh, to uh, Ernest Hemingway, and Hemingway started writing as well. The Lost Generation was uh, introduced by Gertrude Stein. Remember Gertrude Stein? Yes. And she addressed it to the generation of writers who came of age during World War I. She claimed the war left them aimless, directionless, and cynical. That's what you are. That's what all of you are. All you young people who served in the war, you are all a lost generation. Woodrow Wilson. Uh, after the October 2nd, 1919 stroke, Woodrow Wilson was an invalid. The 25th Amendment to the Constitution was rat uh, ratified February 10th, 1967. It established and explained the complete order of presidential succession, as well as a series of contingency plans to fill any vacancies. This is a couple of years ago. Remove Woodrow Wilson's name from New Brunswick Public School now. Now. Uh, Woodrow Wilson's legacy is at best mixed. He led the country during World War I. He was instrumental in crafting the League of Nations. But he was also a racist. He possessed the sympathy for the lost cause narrative. Wilson gave his newly appointed cabinet permission to segregate their departments. The KKK revival came during his term. He basically said, you want to fire any Negroes? Go ahead, fire them. Uh, on June 27, 2020, the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs was changed to the Princeton School uh, of Public, uh, uh, rather, uh, and the Wilson School would be renamed the first college. It was changed to the Princeton School of Public Interest and Affairs. Uh, on January 26, 2022, Camden, New Jersey's Woodrow Wilson High School got a new name, Eastside High School. Wilson uh, had, uh, he basically appointed the first Jewish justice to the Supreme Court, his friend Louis Brandeis. Wilson's agenda, which passed Congress at the end of 1913, included terror, uh, banking, uh, labor reforms, and the introduction of an income tax. Wilson also expanded the executive branch with the creation of the Federal Reserve, the Federal Trade Commission, and the Internal Revenue Service. He also embraced new technology. He started airmail service and endorsed the creation of the new interstate federal highway. Well, there we have Al Jolson next to Warren G. Harding. Uh, Harding died shortly before the completion of his 29th month in office. 
He's mostly remembered for his White House scandals, having a child out of wedlock, paying off a mistress who might have been a German spy. Uh, he was a civil rights advocate. He pushed for maternity and child care funding, and he got it. He got maternity and child care funding. That was taken away in 1929, created the national interstate highway system, and steered the country out of a deep recession. Uh, he introduced celebrity to political campaigning. Al Jolson, one of the globe's biggest stars in the 1920s stump program. Uh, and uh, here is uh, prohibition, or drinking, that ended in 1933. Yes? Something big happened in 1920 that has not been mentioned. What? Uh, the War of Irish Independence. Yes, I can't get everything in there. I also didn't mention, another thing I didn't mention was an Arab attack on Jews in Palestine. Wow, really? Yeah, 1920. 1920. Yeah, I didn't mention the Bolshevik stuff either. So it kept it more United States, you know, but you're right about that, the Irish and the They went into World War I hoping yep. to, because the English yep. were fighting the war, they yep. thought they'd have a chance maybe against England, considering yep. they had, really didn't have any army or anything. Yeah, yeah. And then our, England opened their jails, and, and they let the black and tans into Ireland. Yeah. And my mother sat on the hill watching them come. They had a signal. Yeah. Mayor Briscoe was hiding in the caves on my her uncle's farm. He was the first Lord Mayor of Dublin. Yeah. He was Jewish. Yeah. And he fought alongside, he fought in Ireland for their Irish independence. And uh, so uh, I heard these stories. Oh, I'm sure you did. This is mostly an American talk, though. Yeah. I'd be here for three hours if I talked about the Bolsheviks, about what's going on between the Jews and the Arabs and the Arab terrorist attack. Uh, what was I going thought maybe that was the reason the Catholics didn't support the League of Nations, because England was yeah, involved. Probably. Probably. Uh, oh, getting back to uh, the right to vote. Not all American women got the right to vote. Native Americans were not allowed to be U.S. citizens. So the federal amendment did not give them the right to vote. With the passage of the Snyder Act in 1924, native-born women got American citizenship. As late as 1962, individual states still prevented some women from voting by the use of literary tests, poll taxes, and claims that a resident on the reservation meant that the woman wasn't the uh, a resident of the state. Native-born Americans already had, uh, native-born Asian Americans already had American citizenship in 1920, but first-generation Asian Americans did not. Asian American immigrant women, therefore, excluded from voting until the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1952 allowed them to gain citizenship three decades after the 19th Amendment. Literary test, poll tax. Some African American suffragettes in the suffragettes in the North could vote, but through much of the country, the same voter suppression tactics that kept black men from polls kept black women from voting too. Literacy tests, poll taxes, voter ID requirements, intimidation, uh, and threats, act of violence were problems until the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The Supreme Court overturned portions of the Voters Rights Act of 1965 in 2013, and that allowed a number of states, particularly in the South, to make voting much harder. World Trade Center attacks. The 23 Wall Street attack in Lower Manhattan would remain the deadliest bombing on uh, U.S. soil until the Oklahoma City bombing 75 years later, 1995. Worst attack, well, that was at uh, the World Trade Center, September 11th. Four passenger planes hijacked, two of them crashed into the World Trade Center in New York, one into the Pentagon in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, fourth crashed into a field in Sharksville, Pennsylvania, 3,000 killed, Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda responsible. Uh, no Nazis, you can't have Nazis. Uh, this is Rockstock, Germany. Uh, Adolf Hitler. Uh, and the Nazi party rose to power in 1932. Germany annexed uh, Austria and Czechoslovakia in 1938. 
Poland invaded, uh, was invaded by Germany September 1st, 1939. It starts World War II. Japan bombed Pearl Harbor December 11th, 1941. The war ended in 1945. The Nazi party has been outlawed in Germany. Uh, the flappers. The flapper lifestyle uh, disappeared. Roaring 20s, uh, the era of glitz and glamour for some, came to an end in America after the Wall Street crash in 1929. 1963, Betty Friedan released the book, The Feminine Mystique, which referenced the flappers. The book was the start of the 1960s women's rights movement. There's the babe, New York Yankees. Uh, he's regarded as the greatest baseball player of all time. He last played in 1935, a member of the Boston Braves. His legend looms large uh, despite his home run records being broken. The Chicago White Sox players accused of throwing the 1919 World Series were acquitted uh, by a grand jury but banned from baseball. The Negro, League produced, Negro, Negro Leagues produced talents such as Jackie Robinson and Monty Urban, who I knew, and Henry Aaron, but have faded after Robinson broke the color barrier in 1947. Uh, that is uh, no no Nanette. No no Nanette. Harry Frisay sold the Boston Red Sox franchise to a consortium led by Bob Quinn in 1923. His musical, No No Nanette, opened in Detroit, 1923, reached Broadway, September 16, 1925. It was the most success it was one of the most successful shows of its era, earning Frisay millions of dollars. He died on June 4th. 1929. Super Bowl is the biggest sports event in the United States. Uh, the National Football League, which started out as the All Professional Football Conference, became the NFL June 24, 1922. Uh, how many of you are football fans here? How many of you are going to watch the Super Bowl even if you're not a football fan? You watch the commercials, halftime show, all that. It is the most watched television show in America. Radio, which helped expand the NFL's popularity and seen its better days, most stations are worthless. And we leave with a lost generation of writers. I think they did rather well in selling books. Ernest Hemingway, what do you think? The most successful author of the lost generation? You know, the great Gatsby never sold well during Fitzgerald's lifetime. It sold about 25,000 books between 1925 and his death in 1940. The great Gatsby caught on, was given away for nothing to GIs during World War II. And there is a revival of the great Gatsby on Broadway taking place right now, even though during his lifetime it was one of his worst selling books. Any farewell question? Farewell to arms. Uh, as Hemingway. Hemingway wrote yeah. Farewell to Arms. So. Anyway, any questions or comments? Go ahead. Your turn to talk. I've talked too much. <laughs>